Good morning, everyone. Good morning, saints. Good morning, Zion. It's always exciting to be in the house of the Lord. We come with the spirit of expectancy to see what God can do or what he will do. Because what he's done for others, he'll do for you. It was amazing. Last Sunday, I had the opportunity to see some amazing women in concert at the YouTube Theater. And it was a uh, worship experience to see all the different nationalities praising God. And it's amazing that all the young people were there worshiping, and I mean worshiping hard. By the time I was done that night, I could not speak because the praise and worship was so fierce. So I want us to be like that today because God is good. He is amazing. And you just think about when your parents and your grandparents and even beyond that, how they worship the true and living God. So this morning I woke up and you know, with Jesus on my mind, and I went to Sunday school on Zoom. You know, you can go to Sunday school and church online now. That's another reason to praise the Lord. You can just jump up and push a button and learn more about God. And today, it was about Zechariah, and it talked about Jesus. And uh, that's the Old Testament scripture, talking about Jesus and the blood that Jesus would shed many generations after that. But we are beyond that. So of course, we should praise him for what he has done. So let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, mighty King, King of glory, we come to you worshiping you for who you are. Lord, you are mighty. Lord, you have been faithful. Lord, you have forgiven us for our sins and sent your son to die on the cross for us. And we say thank you. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we know that even when we're saved, we go through things. So we're here to lift up someone that is insecure. We're lift up someone who has, has been going through depression. Lift up those persons that are dealing with mental illness. Lord, we lift them up and lay it all at your feet because you told us to cast our cares on you because you care for us. Lord, we love you, we adore you. We're just here to magnify your holy name. We praise you, Lord. So we ask you to, to be there with the praise team, be there with the pastor, Lord, so that when the word comes, that it will fall on good ground. Let us hear it, Lord. Let us receive it in our hearts so that we can go and show people who you are just by the spirit that you have put in us. Lord, you said that when we were saved, that the Holy Spirit was sealed in us, Lord. So each and every person here brings the Holy Spirit with them as they come into your sanctuary. So Lord, we bless you, we bless your holy name, and we want to praise you in spirit and in truth. So we say hallelujah to your name, Lord. Hallelujah, we're here to lift up the name of Jesus in the name of the true and living God, Jesus the Christ, we say amen and amen. Hallelujah. Come on, stand to your feet. It's time to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. How, you know, how many of you know that it was the blood of Jesus that saved your soul, that made you whole? We're here to worship the name of the Lord today and the sacrifice that he made on the cross. I know. 
Close, please stay up. 
Amen. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Give God a hand to praise this morning because he has blessed us. He has given us yet another day. Amen. It is because he kept us all this week that we are able to enter into this house of worship and give God praise. And so if God has been good to you and you are grateful and thankful, why don't you give God the best praise that you have on this day? And even when we look at this table, that is reminded, right? When we look and we remember the body and the blood and the sacrifice, we proclaim Jesus amen each and every week but on this particular week we realize that God gave us the best thing that he had to offer when he gave us his son Jesus at this time I believe that we have uh, one special announcement I will allow uh, whoever is coming from that committee to come and give your announcement now and then uh, I will pick up with just a few things that uh, I want to share sister Valerie is coming and so sister Valerie Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I would like to um, let everybody know and welcome everybody to Pastor and Family Appreciation Service, July 23rd. It'll be our 11 o'clock service. And I would like for everybody to be here. Come out, invite everyone. We would like to show them the best appreciation for the family as we can, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Valerie, and thank you um, for those who are working in that committee. Um, I just want to real quick, the person to your left and to your right, why don't you say good morning to them? Why don't you check on them? 
Um, it is very important, I believe, that as the body of Christ when we come, and I know that you may ask them how they're doing, and somebody may tell you that they are blessed and that they are highly favored, and while that is indeed fact, right, we understand that every now and then that we come into this place and we are broken and frustrated while being blessed and highly favored, and I have never thought that the church has to be a place where we come and fake it, amen? So you ought to be sitting next to somebody, amen, who if you are broken and if you are frustrated, frustrated that you should feel comfortable enough to not have to fake it but grab a hold to their hand amen and begin to pray and intercede on that behalf and so that is really what the church has to be and so I encourage everyone you don't have to wear a mask in this place because I know a God who is able amen to do all things but fail if we make ourselves available and submit to him and so when we enter um, it is imperative it is important that we are checking on one another amen that we are sharing with, with each other and that we are walking alongside which simply lets us know that we come to this place to encourage each other amen amen god is good now let me take a special privilege uh reverend uh gwendolyn curry if you would stand uh we thank god for her and her service uh and her work that she does in this ministry um, but we are particularly excited about her because on this last Friday, right, it was her last day working for Kaiser. She is retired now. And so we celebrate you and all the years that you have worked and strived. And we know that you are excited, amen, uh, about being able to uh, maybe sleep in a little later and spend some time with your grandchildren and your family. Um, and I will say, uh, I will attempt, right? I will attempt not to put any more on you, uh, but I sure am thankful that I can call you in the middle of the day now. Um, but I'm thankful for your heart, for your work, and for all that you mean uh, to this ministry and to this church. And so we just wanted to say uh, that we love you and we want to do something very, um, we want to do something very kind for you and very nice really soon. Um, but we just want to say again, uh, congratulations on your retirement, uh, Reverend Curry. And then uh, as we come uh, in July, you know that we will be celebrating our Vacation Bible School. I know many of you, uh, you have already, right? You have already volunteered and you signed up, right? And we need this to be 100% effort, every gift, every ability, we need it. Um, but more than that, it is always Vacation Bible School is an opportunity to do what? is an opportunity to evangelize, right? It's all throughout our community. Um, there are children, there are families who do not have, right, a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so it's an opportunity, yes, for us to share the gospel. And so we want you uh, not only to volunteer and to work, amen, but we want to uh, make sure that we are inviting our neighbors, our family, our friends, that we would have um, a blessed vacation Bible school. Um, I know that you have volunteered. There's still time to volunteer. Uh, but as you leave service, today someone from the board of christian education will have registration forms right registration forms uh, so that we can plan and prepare for the number of families and people that will be with us on that week so will you help me with that uh, and make sure that we have a blessed vacation bible school amen amen give god a hand to praise this worship team is coming back to us on this morning and we come to celebrate god because he has been good to us amen and so we encourage you to lift your hands to worship um, just a few weeks ago, I happened to see a picture uh, and praise and worship was going on and there was a group of our children, probably four or five of the children and during praise and worship, they were dancing and they were singing um, and they were excited, amen. And I believe that when we come into worship, we all ought to be childlike, amen, because we know how good God has been to us. Sometime we've just gotten too stuffy, amen, um, but we've come, this is a place where you should be free to worship God however you feel free. And so that if that is a dance, if that is a run, whatever, it may be uh, and just in case anyone thought that it was inappropriate I don't care each and every week these kids can dance up and the, up and down the aisle because maybe it's that we pinched them and told them to be quiet too much that now we sit in church like God has not been good to us and so if we train them up early in the way that they should go and that this is the place of worship I believe amen I believe we nurture that spirit of worship in them not only to work them in the church but we don't only come to work we come to lift up God amen and so give God a hand to praise on this morning as this praise and worship team come back to us. God bless you.
Father, we come to give you all the glory. So in this preaching moment, I pray that if any attention or focus is given to me, let it simply be because you are using me. And I pray that the people don't see Adam. They don't hear Adam, but they hear the words that you have poured down deep in my heart. And Father, I don't say it out of the appropriateness of being clergy or just to be cliche. But I ask that you empty me of myself and feel me because if you have your way lives will be forever changed chains will be broken families will be restored relationships with you will be mended so father let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you and you alone, Father. In the awesome name of Jesus, we pray. Let everyone that agrees shout amen. Amen, amen, amen. God is good. God is gracious. And just the mere fact that I could stand before you uh, in this space with just a little bit of strength, amen. Um, I am blessed and I am grateful, but every time that I stand in, right here behind this sacred desk, I know it is only because of the grace of God, because I know Adam, amen, uh, but because of the blood and because the blood still works and because of his love for me, amen, he allows me this honor, amen, and it is an honor um, to preach this, his, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which saved me, amen, and still has saving power, uh, but then to get the opportunity to preach to the, those you um, who are his children. Amen. Um, I intend to be uh, devotional uh, more than sermonic on this morning. Uh, don't even, uh, if I have my way, I will not hold you or I will not keep you long, but I always leave room for the Holy Ghost to do what the Holy Ghost is going to do. Amen. And so I make you uh, no promises, but uh, on today, brevity uh, is possibly going to be my best friend. Uh, and so if you will, turn with me to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, we'll look at verses 7 through 15, again, uh, in your Bible, on your phone, your iPad somewhere, um, we want to get to this epistle of the Apostle Paul, um, and we will look at just a few verses here my version may differ from yours just a bit nevertheless uh, it is the word of God it reads this way now we have this treasure in clay jars so that this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us we are afflicted in every way but not crushed we are perplexed but not in despair we are persecuted but not abandoned we are struck down but not destroyed we always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may be displayed in our body. Verse 11, for we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that Jesus' life may also be displayed in our mortal flesh. So then death is at work in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith in keeping with what is written, I believed, and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you. Indeed, everything is for your benefit, so that as grace extends more and more people, it may cause thanksgiving to increase of the glory of God. Let me preach from the thought on this morning, uh, a treasure within, a treasure within. The Apostle Paul is um, by far 
uh, one of my favorite uh, biblical personalities, or maybe I should say authors, um, in the Word of God. And it is not so much that he wrote uh, most of the, the New Testament, but there is something that is particular. There is something about Paul that stands out and should stand out to each and every one of us uh, that I want to bring in to your attention on this morning. And while there's much that I can say about Paul, I believe that what strikes me, I believe that what captivates me most about the Apostle Paul is, watch this, it is his awareness of he, who he was and who it is that God is. Let me see if I can make this make sense on this morning. Chris Hodges says, and I quote, Paul was focusing on what was happening in him, not to him. Likewise, we can be sure that when something is happening to us, God is doing something in us, something that will shape us for eternity. Uh, if we are truly then the people of God and if we want to then operate the way that God intended for the church to operate and if we want to be who it is that God has called us to be and desires for you and I to be if we are going to do this work that we have been commissioned to do as the people of God then we need to realize that each and every circumstance and situation every trial right every blessing all the good all the bad all this work that we put in in the church, watch this, is shaping us for eternity. Uh, and so then, uh, for just a few minutes, I encourage you to take heed to what it is that God is showing us in this message. And there are four distinct qualities, if you will. Four, four distinct qualities that we will find in the Apostle Paul, here we go, that made him impactful. Somebody say impactful. Uh, because we can do this thing, we can open up the church, we can put on programs, we can put ushers at the door, and we can count the money, but it does not mean that we are impactful, right? And we want to be impactful for what? For the kingdom of God, and there is no better model than the Apostle Paul in which to show us how to be impactful. Well, you may say, when Paul was writing all of these years ago, things were very different, but I got a feeling my word reminds me that God is the same. When he's the same what yesterday today and forevermore and so the same God that was working in the New Testament church is able to work today as well that you and I right individually and corporately and collective for the church should be impactful and so it was these four things that 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 that, that Paul had uh, within him uh, that he possessed that made him impactful if we look at 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 verse seven. It says, now we have this treasure in clay jars that this extraordinary power may be from God and not us. And so the first thing right here, right in verse number seven that I want to show you about Paul, the way that you and I should operate. I'm talking about from the pulpit uh, to the pew or to the chair or whatever, from, from my position all the way to yours. We see that Paul had a spirit of humility. Hard to come by in the church today. And I'm talking about from the pulpit all the way to the back. It's hard to find a group of people, right, or a person who is willing to be humble. But Paul had this. Paul, watch, the text teaches us that Paul sees himself as nothing more than a clay pot. This, this, this is a powerful depiction of how Paul sees himself because in this particular day here we the pot the pots right these earthen vessels if you will that some of your your bibles may say that they were used they were cheap right you can you can easily attain them and just as much as you can attain one if you broke it uh, then it meant nothing you would just sweep it up off the floor go back into the marketplace and you can find another vessel but this was the thing it was easy to come by it didn't take much much effort and these, these, these pots were usually found in homes, right? And although they weren't worth very much, what would typically be within them was very expensive. And so you can come into a home, you would see this earthen vessel, and while on the outside it looked like it was not much, many of the people in that particular day would hide very valuable things within. Are you with me? And so, uh, while they weren't worth much, Paul recognized his lowly estate when he compares himself to this clay jar. He, he, he understands that he's nothing more than a clay jar. 
Uh, he, he understands that, that he in, in, in himself, he's not really worth anything, but he does understand the power that is working within him. Let me see if I can make this make sense. Paul realizes that when he was on that Damascus road and he was knocked off of his animal and he had that confrontation with Jesus that changed his life and then he goes away for a few days and remember he had the scales on his eyes and then the scales fell off and he saw something something new. Paul realizes that when he came in relationship with Jesus Christ, that there was now a power that was working inside of him that maybe people could not see it, but he realized and he understood that based on this connection and this relationship, while people might not have thought much of him, what do you mean, Pastor Adam? Some, some, some say, uh, that, that, that the Apostle Paul, in terms of stature and in terms of how he looked, that he really wasn't a handsome guy. Uh, that if you saw the Apostle Paul, you wouldn't think much of him, that he was just this bald, frumpy, uh, short guy, that there wasn't much about him. So people had a tendency, stay with me, to overlook him. But Paul never allowed that, right? What people thought about him to get in the way of the mission and who he is that knows that God had created him to be. Stay with me. Y'all quiet on this morning, but it's going to make sense in a minute. One theologian is clear that at our best, that's me and you. We are no more than dignified dirt. Uh, he says God uses a nothing like him so that his power and greatness could be displayed to the world. Stay with me. So when you, when you and I, right, tap your neck, that's when you, when you and I begin to operate as the body of Christ, when we begin to move together as the church, hear me, we understand that there's nothing in particular about you and I that we have to brag or boast about. Some of y'all don't want to hear that because y'all this kind of thing, and I don't want to put you down. I don't want to take your self-esteem away, but if there's anything good about you is the mere fact that you got a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you got any anointing, if there's anything that you are doing in the body of Christ and you are being impactful or effective, it is not because you are so smart or creative or intelligent. It is that power. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost that is working within you that things begin to happen that you make a difference. Uh, it's the power of God working in us pots and us earthen vessels and us this dignified dirt. Watch this. That, 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 that brings salvation. And so then if God is going to truly use any of us, it is, it is an imperative. It would behoove us then that we recognize, hear me, who God is and who we are. It, it, it gets messed up sometimes. It gets, it gets con convoluted. We, we, we mix it up. And while I am very grateful and thankful, right, uh, when they have these opportunities, like in a few weeks where they would do a pastor uh, in family appreciation, and they appreciate, and they might uh, take a picture and get a cake and all of that stuff. And I'm very thankful for all of that. Um, but I'm talking about within myself when I really understand, and if I'm honest with myself, there is nothing particularly aw so awesome about me or my family that we deserve, right, that we deserve anything so nothing special but then if you see Jesus Christ in us and you are imitating the Christ in us then we'll take all the praise and adulation all as long as God is getting the glory does that make sense and so then as I always say we must have a high view of God somebody say a high view of God and a low view of oneself and any time that that thing turns upside down, we are headed towards disaster, and the church is in a very terrible place. And I don't care if you got two people or 22,000 people, God has to be right. Jesus Christ has to be the center of everything that we do. How do I know this? Because in my Bible, Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 6, I won't go there, but write it down. Uh, and, and it tells us, right, it reminds us that even Jesus, he decided, and I'm paraphrasing, right, that he would put down his crown, right, and out of humility he would come here and he would serve. And so you are saved and delivered and set free in all that good church talk that we talk today because Jesus decided to be a servant and because he was humble. And if we want to be anything like Jesus, right, then first we must be humble. Somebody say humble. Uh, but secondly, uh, verses 8 through 9 of the text, not only was Paul, right, was he humble, and should you and I then uh, for the kingdom be humble, but in verses 8 through 9, we see something else. Paul says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. 
We are struck down, but not destroyed. Secondly, you take notes. Paul says if you want to be impactful for the kingdom, then, then you must be unconquerable. Here we go. Paul was one that refused to allow his circumstances to conquer him or kill the message that was inside him. Yeah, yeah. I, I can prove it, right? We, 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 we all know the history of Paul. We, 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 we know about the shipwrecks, right? We know about the fact that he was uh, beaten. We know about the fact that he was in prison. We know that he would write, especially uh, that scripture that we like to use uh, in uh, Philippians 4 and 13, and y'all put it on the side, side of shoes and everything and think, because you say, I can do all things through Christ, that you're going to dunk a ball. That is not what Paul was talking about. <laughs> what Paul was saying is that even if he was hungry and even if he was beaten, that it was a power that was working inside of him, that he was unconquerable. unconquerable. I mean, I can do all things through Christ, which gives me strength, meaning this, if I am hungry, if I am tired, if people are talking about me, or if the person next to me at church don't like me, I'm not going to allow anything to get in my way from doing what it is that God has called me to do. I'm talking to somebody because we got a sneaky, we got a tendency to hop churches and go somewhere else because folks don't like me. You don't have to like me is what Paul says. I will not allow how you feel about me to get in the way of who God God created me to be. And so because Paul understands this, he understands my circumstances will not allow me to abandon my faith. Uh, but but, but he, he begins to go uh, through, through these, these, these set of, of, of circumstances and situations that he has been through, right? As he talks to us, as he talks to church and says, just in case this is happening to you, you got to be, be prepared to continue to move. Watch this. So Paul says he was afflicted. This means that he was subjected to pressure. Pay attention to the pressure that was on his life. Watch this. The pressure that he found, right, that was coming towards him was for the sake of the gospel. Meaning that each and every day when the rooster crowed, right, when Paul got up off of his cot or whatever or in that prison cell and put his feet on the floor, Paul knew this, that every single day because of the gospel, because of this power that was working in him, that he was in danger every day. Meaning this, every day somebody was attempting to take his life. Every day he was being persecuted. Every day, watch this, not only did he have the pressure from without, but he had the pressure from within. What do you mean? Because he loved the church. He understood his calling. And so while he was in personal danger himself, these letters, right, the epistles, Paul is sitting somewhere, and while he's in danger, he's worried about the church, what? At Colossus, he's worried about the Philippian church. He's worried about the Corinthian church. Paul, he got enough going on in his life that's going on personally with him but he writes these letters right because he realized that someone needs to hear he said I got pressure on every side I got pressure trying to live every day but it's a sister and a brother in the church that I'm concerned he got all this going on yet Paul realizes Paul says however my back is against the wall Paul declares I got pressure but I'm not crushed somebody ought to catch that he says, while, while the pressure is trying to kill me, right, he says this. He says, I understand that it's the hand of God that won't let this stuff crush me. Y'all missed it. He never attempts to say that it's not there, right? It, that it's, it's happening. Uh, do I, do I want to say this this morning? Uh, we we got to, uh, I believe it's the enemy, uh, but that, that every time we get a little pressure, Every time uh, the, the pressure is on and they're afflicted, right? Um, um, some people, right, don't want to step on nobody's toes, right? But if the shoe fit, you got to wear it on this one. Immediately when there is pressure or you are afflicted, you will immediately, right, you will immediately say, I don't accept that. I don't receive that. The blood, and you and will claim all this stuff. But it comes with this, right? The enemy is after us. So you are afflicted for the gospel's sake. You got to remember, Jesus carried a cross, and he told us that if we wanted to be his disciples, we would have to do what? That we would have to pick up our cross and carry. That means that we will be afflicted, but Paul reminds us because of the hand of God, God has a way of allowing some things to stay where though we are afflicted, he won't let it get a hold to you. 
But he says, not only am I afflicted, he said, I'm afflicted, I'm going to still go on. He says, but you know what? Some days I wake up and I'm perplexed. Somebody say perplexed. Uh, this stuff just don't make no sense. He says, I'm literally at a loss. He says, I, I, I look around and I'm baffled, right? Uh, uh, I'm puzzled and I'm looking, right? Paul is talking to Pastor Adam. He's talking to you. I'm looking at my situation and saying, how in the world did I get here? Or y'all don't want to, or, 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 I, I thought I just prayed, or I thought I just dealt with this situation another time, or this ain't the first time that my family's been attacked. I thought the last time we went to therapy, and then they told us how to be a better mother, a better father, a better husband, a better wife, or whatever it is, and I hope some of y'all is going to get some therapy, because we all show enough need some, but I thought the last time I had it figured out, how is it that I got the same situation happening again? Paul says, I'm perplexed. Paul's saying, though I'm perplexed, watch this. He said, I'm perplexed. I'm baffled. It don't make no sense. It's confusing. But he says, but I'm not in despair. I will not, watch this, allow the enemy, right? He can come after my body, but I will not him allow him to attack my heart and mind, meaning this. I remember no matter what I'm going through, who the God that I serve is, that he is mighty, that he is a strong tower, that he will protect me, that he will keep me. Paul says this, I have on the helmet of salvation, and if everything else is under attack, my mind is not under attack. He says, so therefore, I will not allow myself to fall into despair somebody say despair that's why it's very important then when we come into worship each and every Sunday when they are singing about a God that is great what I have found that will keep me out of despair right because of my humanity is simply lifting my hand and allowing the joy of the Lord to be my strength meaning my circumstance is what it is but my God is who he is as well and so I can sing about his greatness I can sing about his glory I continue to adore him though I am perplexed about my situation I'm not in despair. Somebody tap yourself and say, I might be going through something and it feels like I'm about to lose my mind. But Paul says, I do not have to be in despair. Watch this. He says, I refuse to lose hope. Somebody ought to catch that. Put it in your purse and take it home with you. He says, in the midst of confusing circumstances, here we go. He says, I find my strength in God. Understanding who God is keeps us Right, holds us when that spirit of despair comes. But I'm moving, I'm moving. Number three, he says, he says, not only, he says, watch this, he says, but I am, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm persecuted at the same time. This means that he was being hunted down like an animal. This means that he was being stopped. This means he's being tormented. This means he's being mistreated. But watch what he says. He says, I'm persecuted, but not forsaken. Catch that. He says, I'm persecuted, but not forsaken. Meaning when everyone would abandon him and he was sitting in a dark, dingy, damp uh, cell somewhere in the, be in the bottom of a jail and he felt all alone, right? And nobody wasn't writing any letters or checking on him. How is it that Paul could say that he was not forsaken? Watch this, because he understood who God was, that God was his shepherd and that God was his keeper and that God was a brother that sticks closer than a friend. He realized that God could be his mother, his father, his friend, and his everything. And so he says, I'm persecuted by everyone else and everything else around me. Watch this. He says, I'm still standing, even though I'm being stocked. Watch this. Because he knew the God that was shielding him. Meaning this. They can have the weapons. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. They, they can put your name on their tongue and talk about you. 
They, 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 they can criticize you. They can critique you. They can plot and they can plan against you, right? But Paul understood that God was his shield and that God was his buckler and that God was his rock and that he could just ride right there in the midst of God and know that God was keeping him and protecting him and loving him and comforting him. What do you mean? Pastor Adam, I love you, I appreciate you, but if you abandon me right now, I will not be forsaken because that is the benefit of my relationship with Jesus Christ. He has given me the Holy Ghost. Somebody say the Holy Ghost. And I ain't talking about jumping, dancing, and running. I'm talking about when I am laying there in tears or hitting my pillow. I feel a warmth, I feel a presence, and I feel the Holy Spirit that is there keeping me, comforting me, and revealing to me. Paul says I'm persecuted but I'm not forsaken. Watch this. He also says I'm struck down. Somebody say struck down. That means he's being hit with weapons. But, 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 but the depiction is that as if he's being hit with a billy club or a bat. Do y'all got it? So the symbolism he's saying I'm being beaten and I'm being struck. Here he goes. He says, this situation that I'm in is trying to knock every bit of last strength out of me. And he knows, watch this, that though he is being struck, watch this, he says, but I know that I'm not destroyed. Catch it. Uh, Y'all, uh, us, we, we used to say uh, something along the lines. Let me see if I still, um, if my mind can still remember when I was a kid. Uh, we'll say something like sticks and stones may break my bones. But words, and you know, will, will never hurt me. Matter of fact, I don't know why they taught us that, because that's a lie. <laughs> it's, it's a lie, okay? Sticks and stones, they'll break your bones, but I didn't have some words that have cut deep. Right? But, Paul, what he's showing us, though, that even if sticks and stones break our bones, and even if the words hurt us, he, he, he reminds us here that we are not destroyed, stay with me, be, because even though someone may have or will do things to hurt you, the beauty of the word of God and the beauty of when we study is immediately, watch this, we are reminded not so much of what people are saying to us or what they are doing, but what it is that God has said to you. And so I ask you the question in your private time, in your personal time, when he called you, when he anointed you, when you got saved, what was it that God was saying about? About you what did God tell you about you and it doesn't matter what everyone else is saying about you got to be reminded of what of who God called you to be and who God says that you are and when you live at that level though it may hurt it won't destroy you and for it not to destroy you means it won't stop you I'm moving and so Paul here he is he says I, I here I am I'm going through all these things he says but I'm unconquerable uh, and this was right. So not only was he was he humble, but he was unconquerable. But there was something else about Paul that we can learn. Watch this in verses 10 through 11. We find that Paul is sacrificial. Somebody say sacrificial. Paul realizes I'm going to say it again. And what you and I got to grab hold of, that he was just a clay jar. In verse 10, he reminds us that that the enemy and the people right uh, were, were uh, wanted to kill him because of the Jesus that was in him. I'm going to say it again. The people who were after him and wanted to destroy him was because of the Jesus that was working on the inside of him. And so Paul understands this. Let me see if I go slow and make it make sense. Paul is aware, catch this church, that they hate Jesus, so they attack him. Go. They, 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 they can't stand Jesus. The enemy can't stand Jesus. Jesus. I, I, I know y'all think y'all, and you think that the devil is just, oh, the devil, he always, he can't stand the Jesus that is in, inside of you. I told you, it's the power that's working in you, right? And so Paul understood the reason that they're coming after me is because the Jesus that is on the inside of him, watch this, and Paul doesn't say it, uh, but I want to infer here that Paul, right, probably was some joy in which Paul would write about the joy that he had, because if you're going to be attacked, it's good to be attacked because of the Jesus. 
Jesus that's inside of you, that ought to bring you some joy just to know that Jesus is working inside of you in such an impactful way that the enemy can't stand you because of the Jesus inside of you. And so, what is amazing is the next part of that is because of the Jesus that's inside of him. Somebody say the Jesus. Jesus. They spew false allegations. They lie on him. Right? They, they, they say he's not worth much. Right? This is the stuff that they were saying about Paul. They, they, they were calling him a hypocrite. But what we find that's important and encouraging is we know that many of these things that come against us, Jesus told them that they would have. So it doesn't catch Paul off guard because he, re he is reminded of what it is that Jesus, here we go, told him that would happen to us. I was, I was at a, a concert on last Sunday, and I was at the YouTube theater, uh, uh, and I believe that the young lady who was up there singing, I think her name was like Naomi Rain or, 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 or something like that, right? Um, but she said something that stuck with me. She said, many of us, accepted Jesus without counting the cost. Y'all didn't hear me. We, we, we confessed him, and pro, but we didn't count the cost. We, 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 we heard the story, which is good. We heard the gospel, but, 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 but we forget the part, right, that says that we'll be crucified and we'll be like sheep to the slaughter. And, and, and so sometimes because we ignore that part and we didn't count the cost, then we are confused then when all of this trouble, but it comes along with the territory of being a child of God. Does that make sense? And so since Paul understands this, he understands that there was one who was no more sacrificial right than Jesus because he gave up his life and so Paul realizes that to be in this thing and to confess and profess the name of Jesus that there has to be something in us that's willing to be sacrificial and take what comes because of the Jesus that's inside of us here we go John chapter 15 18 through 25 just in case uh, uh, y'all forgot and it's too late you might not have counted the cost beforehand but I'm going to remind you of the cost but like the song you say, ain't no turning back right but I'm just going to remind y'all y'all confessed him you'll profess him we're going to keep him but I need you to remember this part John chapter 15 18 through 25 it says if the world hates you keep in mind that it hated me first verse 19 if you belong to the world it will love you as its own as it is you do not belong to the world tap your neighbor say you don't belong to the world but I have chosen you out of the world, and this is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Jesus, right, he reminds them this is what come. You are no greater what? Than your master. And the fact that they persecuted me means that they are going to come after you. And so each and every time they come after you while you're taking the blows and hit, you ought to be worshiping and celebrating at the same time because that means that you are doing this thing right and I don't belong to the world and the world is just going to have to dislike me sometimes because I am going to stand up for the name of Jesus. Y'all ain't talking because the church is a little too quiet for me in this 21st century with all that's going on in the world the church is just quiet and going along with everything but we're going to have to be willing to make some sacrifice if that mean I can't have your 501c3 or I can't get no government grant because I don't stand for you and your foolishness I I stand for Jesus Christ and who he's called me to be and I am going to be the light that's what the church was initially called to be y'all stay with me which means that some stuff we are not even want from the world y'all 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 don't y'all y'all don't want to talk about that though what we see here in verse 11 and, and I'm done Paul here's reference to Jesus being delivered over to those who would ultimately crucify him catch this Paul says I'm constantly facing death because of my representation of Christ. He says, through our weaknesses, hear me, when you and I are awake, Christ is put on display. Here we go, talking slow for a reason, so you can't. They kill you, but it's okay, because every time they kill you, Christ is being made more alive. That was somebody shouting cue. Somebody should have clapped their hands and say, every time they persecute us, every time they come after us, every time we get hit, watch this, we may be slowly dying, but Christ is becoming what? More alive. Christ is being made alive. 
which means that we are being killed and empowered at the same time. Y'all missed it. That went right over y'all's head. We're being killed and empowered at the same time. Watch this. When Jesus is on the inside of us, lastly, uh, Paul was faithful. Somebody say faithful. You find this in verses 13 through 15. He preaches, here we go, church, purely on the motivation of his own belief. He preaches purely on the motivation of his own belief. What he preaches, he believes down in his heart. What he teaches, he believe, it, it, it ain't his mama's faith, it ain't his daddy's faith, it ain't his neighbor's faith, it ain't his pastor's faith. What comes out of mouth in every letter and everything that he utters about his God and about his Jesus is purely off of what it is that he believes. Watch this. And so Paul, when he preaches and when he teaches, he said, I believe, so therefore I speak. Meaning this, he believed the word of God. Pause. He believed the word of God, so he preached it. I have a question for you. Do you believe the word of God? Do you believe the word of God? Do you believe the power of the gospel? Because if you believe it, like they used to say, you can't keep it to yourself. You find yourself talking about the goodness of God at the hospital, in the bank. Everything can be going wrong in your life, but you cannot keep your mouth shut. Can I tell y'all a secret? It's a whole lot of Sundays that I just want to stay. Stay in the bed, but because I believe it, I got to speak it. I got to preach it. I don't even feel comfortable if I'm not preaching this gospel. I'm moving. He not only preaches what he believes, but he preaches his convictions. Paul here borrows from the psalmist. In Psalm 116 and 10, the psalmist says, I believed even when I was severely oppressed. The psalmist in this verse is saying, It is my faith in God that keeps me talking about him. It is my belief in who God is that I can't help but serve him. It is who I know God is and how he's kept me that even when I'm oppressed and I am up under the gun and it feels like I am losing my mind, I am tired, I am worn out, I am confused. People don't like me. I can't get up out the bed some days. I ain't talking about me because y'all going to go home and say, what's wrong with the pastor? But every now and then, it is me. But I'm like Paul. Even when I am oppressed, I cannot help but throw my hands up and talk about the goodness of God. If you believe the word, then it ought to be coming out of your mouth. Hear me? If you believe it, that means you speak it over your children. If you believe it, that means you speak it over your marriage. If you believe it, that means you speak it over your job. I'm telling you, when I was on the job, I would get there at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I would go in that office, and I will be praying and pleading the blood of Jesus all over all them crazy people in my office. And sometime my supervisor would come, and he would knock, and he would say, Stevenson, I'll say, no, you got to wait till I'm done pleading the blood of Jesus because I believe it, and I speak it, so you're going to have to respect because I'm going to need Jesus to keep me in this place and to keep me up off of you. If you keep on, I'm just being real. But because I believe it, I speak it. Because I believe it, I depend on it. Because I believe it, it convicts me. Can I say this? If you're just comfortable in your own mess, it ought to at least be a struggle. Can I say that? Pastor Adam got a whole lot of crazy stuff there, but it's a struggle. I don't try to be crazy every day, but some days I'm a little crazy, but I feel bad about it, and I ask God to keep working on me, and I'm not where I want to be yet, but because of my convictions of who God is, it's something in me where it's some turmoil. If you're just comfortable doing any and everything, you might want to try this thing again, right? Because when you believe it, right, but you got the faith to believe that that word, word is still working on you in your heart and your mind and sanctifying you and purifying you and making you better every day and Paul says watch this I might not have it all together but I still speak it here's my note to somebody because some of us are waiting to use our gifts and abilities and share the gospel with family and friends alike right because you think you're not worthy to share the gospel but the beauty of the gospel 
is that none of us are worthy. And because we were saved by grace, that is what's going to save everybody else, meaning they can know all your struggles, your past, and you can remind them, look how my life is. Look how I was down in the muck and the mire, and he saved me, meaning Paul says, I am the chief of sinners, and if he can save me, he can save anybody. So Paul says, because I saw it work in my life, I can't keep my mouth shut. I'm done. He says, I preach because I believe it. He says, he lives it because he believes it. He says, he share it because he believes it. He says, I sing about it because I believe it. He says, I'm going to say it again. He says, I preach it because I believe it. Do you believe it? He says, I live it because I believe it. Do you believe it? He says, I share it because I believe it. Do you believe it? He says, I sing it because I believe it. And watch this. He says, and it's all for the glory of God. It's all for the glory of God. Absolutely none of it is about me. They don't have to put my name on nothing. They don't have to. It's all for the glory of God that God would get the glory that God's name would be magnified, that God's name would be extolled. Don't go telling nobody about the goodness of Pastor Adam, but if you see anything that's going on, you ought to tell them about the goodness and the glory and the love and the kindness and the patience and the long-suffering of the God we serve. That's why. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, my childhood pastor were preaching, I'm done here. But he would stand and he would say, without God, I could do nothing. Without God, I'd surely fail. Without God, my life would be rugged, just like a ship without a sail. And when we come to the end of ourselves, we realize like Paul, we're nothing but clay jars, but it's the power of God. And so we stand everywhere we go and we proclaim to the world, without God, I would be nothing. Without God, I would surely fail. Without God, I would have lost my mind. Without God, my family would be sleeping under a bridge. Without God, my kids would be strung out. Without God, keep on keeping me. Watch this. And with God, even if all that is going on in your family, because of who he is, my grandmama would say, he sits high, but he looks low, and he reaches low. So you still, despite your life and what may be going on, God is working on your behalf. Watch this. There is a treasure within you. Your relationship with Jesus Christ, hear me, church, makes you valuable. Uh, there is a story of um, a young man who, who found uh, a particular rock. Um, and, and, and the rock that, that he found all these years ago is known as the Star of David Sapphire. But when he came across it, he didn't really know what it was. And he tried to sell it, and nobody, right, nobody would buy it. And so there was a story that said he had this, and he just put it under his bed. Watch this. And there it was, this big, valuable sapphire that was just sitting in the dark because nobody knew the value of the sapphire. Can I preach to somebody? Are you just somewhere in the dark because you don't know your value? You don't know who God created you to be, and you keep putting your light under a bushel. You keep being quiet. You keep not going for that promotion. You keep not launching out and starting that business. You are valuable like a a sapphire and you just sitting in the dark somewhere because you believe in what the enemy said about you but I rebuke that in the name of Jesus right now that somebody would begin to know the treasure that is on the inside of them and live and be who it is that God has called you to be and allow your light to shine if nobody goes with you realize that God and the Holy Ghost will walk with you he is the good shepherd Pastor Adam I don't know the first thing about business uh, neither do I but can I tell you I didn't did some crazy deals in my life that God has blessed me because the Holy Spirit was whispering in my ear and I was just talking I ain't got no college degree and I ain't putting down school or nothing but when God has a place that he wants to take you there is absolutely nothing that can stop you all to stand on your feet and touch yourself
yourself and remind yourself of who your God is and the treasure that is within you. You ought to go for every dream. You ought to go for every accomplishment. You ought to open your mouth. You ought to trust God. There is a treasure inside of you. Nudge your neighbor and say it like you believe it. There's a treasure inside of me. You ain't got to see it, but God didn't already prophesied it. Don't believe me? Just watch. Don't believe me? Just watch what God can do with anybody. If you just believe him, if you just trust on him, if you just depend on him, we go, what eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. People cannot even fathom what it is that God is desiring to do through you. And your past don't count because of the blood. Who you used to be don't count because of the blood. What they used to call you don't count because of the blood. The word of God for the people of God. To God be the glory. Those of us who celebrate the worship the way that we do because we have come to a realization because we realize that this treasure that is within us is because at some point in our life we made a decision to submit our lives and allow him to become the Lord of our life simply meaning that we came to the end of ourselves. And that means that somebody preached or taught or we came across the gospel and it impacted us and penetrated us in such a way that we profess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And if you have come to the end of yourself, this same thing is available to you on today. From the youngest to the oldest, I want you to know that Jesus gave his very life for you. That when nothing else could help, that God gave us the very best thing that he had to offer in his son Jesus. Well, Pastor Adam, how does this work? The Bible simply says, if you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you believe in him, right? If you believe that God did what? That he sent his son, that Jesus came, he lived, he walked this earth, right? Then he was crucified, he died, he was buried, but then he got up on that third day morning with all power in his hands. And then from there, right, he ascended and he sits at the right hand of the Father till he comes again. And if you simply, right, repent of your sin and you profess and you believe that and you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says you will be saved this day. And that is what is available to you. And I can tell you this, giving my life to Jesus was the best thing I've ever done. And I don't care if don't nobody else believe it. I believe it all to myself. I can have family and friends who can think that I'm absolutely crazy for the way that I serve. But can I tell you this? He's real and he's real to me. And if you would allow him to come in your life, he will show you just how real he is. Even if you don't walk down the aisle, we give you an opportunity where you can meet with myself or Reverend Curry at the end of service. And we will simply speak to you and share with you the gospel and the hope, right, that somebody's life uh, will be changed, that somebody will come to salvation in Jesus Christ. It is the first Sunday. And we are preparing uh, for the Lord's Supper. And, and, and as I pre prepare to read, I want you to sit and on the front of that table it says do this in remembrance of me. And what we do here is two sacraments of the church in our way. It's, it's bapti baptism and the Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion. And so this is a very holy moment, yes, that we enter into. But it is a celebratory moment that we enter into. Because of his body and because of his blood, amen. When we take his body and when we take the bread as his body and we take the wine 
uh, as his blood. We proclaim Jesus Christ, amen? Meaning that every time we do this, we say to the world that Jesus is alive. And we're simply, right, we're simply waiting as the church. And as we do this work, we're simply waiting for our Savior to come back. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking henceforth in his holy ways. Draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to the almighty God meekly kneeling upon your knees. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful souls and bodies may be made clean by his death and washed through his most precious blood and that he may evermore dwell in him as he in us. Amen. The prayer of consecration. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy did us give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction of the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father. We most humbly beseech thee and grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. The Lord's Prayer.
you prepare to take the bread. It represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee. Preserve thy soul and body into everlasting life. Take and eat now. And remember that Christ died for thee. And feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. After you have taken the bread, take the cup. Which represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you and for me. Which preserves our soul and body to everlasting life. Take and drink now. And remember that Christ's blood was shed for you. And be thankful. We thank God for you. As we prepare to take our tithes as well as our offering, we trust God that he would touch your heart and your mind and that as you give on today, just give in faith, give believing, give trusting. The ways in which you can give are before you several areas besides your tithes and your offerings in which you can give that continues to help us to do outreach ministry and to do mission work and to continue to have impact for the kingdom of God not only within our communities but right here within our church and so I say thank you for your gifts on today for your tithe and for your offering and for your sacrifice on today I think we're doing two things at once, and so I thank the, the ushers as well as the stewards for your work on today. Uh, the Bible reminds us that for anything, no one has served God, and for all of our service to God, that he would bless us a hundredfold. Amen. And so when we are given our time, and when we are given our talent, and when we are given our treasure, and when we are making sacrifice, my Bible reminds me that we will be blessed a hundredfold. And so we pray, pray hundredfold blessings over your life. We pray hundredfold blessings over your families. We pray hundredfold blessings over your ministries. We pray, pay hundred. We pray for hundredfold blessings over your endeavors and all that you are trusting God and where He would take you. God, we thank you for the gift as well as the giver. I pray that you'll bless every hand that had to give. Bless every hand that intended to give and wanted to give. God. I pray that you would continue, Father, because you are a provider and because the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to you. I quote, as the psalmist said, I was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging for bread. And so I pray, Father, that you bless. But not only do I say that you bless, but I realize, Father, that we are your arms, that we are your eyes. And show us, Father, where we need to continue to be impactful in the life of your church and your people. And Father, if there's any before me, Father, that is suffering, any before me, Father, that, that is in need, Father, I pray, Father, that you would give them a spirit of humility. I pray that the Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us, Father, that based on what you have blessed us with, Father, that we'll bless those that are right here before us, Father. We love you and we thank you and we give you all the glory. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Let everyone that agrees shout amen. Amen, amen. God bless you. We thank God for you. Uh, as we go into the 4th in, Fourth of July weekend, I pray, or week, I pray that you would have safe, have a safe 4th of July. Enjoy your family, enjoy your friends. Probably everyone in Los Angeles County would tell you uh, to not, right, to go somewhere and to in, be entertained and let the professionals do the fireworks. So I'm going to tell you the same thing. Uh, but I know somebody might not listen to me, but I am going to ask you, even if you decide to, please be very safe because each and every year, uh, the emergency rooms in a hospital are full of those who have these accidents based on these fireworks, all right? Um, and so I pray as you enjoy your family and friends, uh, find somewhere safe that you can go and enjoy the fireworks and enjoy this week. Until we meet again, be strong and courageous. God bless you. We love you. Until we meet again, God bless you.